In the 1971 movie, police detective Dirty Harry tortures a kidnapper as a last ditch effort to save a young girl. Torture is, of course, not an acceptable uh, police method, but the question spelled out by the Dirty Harry movie is still highly relevant. Are dirty means appropriate for reaching good ends? The answer, I think, depends in part of on the meaning of dirty. In a contemporary digital setting, we can imagine Dirty Harry Juniors pursuing morally good ends with dirty cutting edge technology. The dirtiness then is a matter of pushing the limits, thereby violating the rights of the citizens. I shall first try to show why dirtiness is particularly likely to occur within the practice of policing. Secondly, I will explain in what sense emergent technology make this problem worse. And finally, suggest a possible uh, way of coping with this problem. Now, pushing the limits is, of course, not exclusive to policing. In uh, clinical settings, doctors use drugs in off-label or unlicensed manners quite often, and at times tough prioritization is needed. But why are the police especially prone to dirty solutions? Well, studies of police culture point out that the police are action-oriented and pragmatic, and for good reasons. After all, they are up against criminals who actively want to make their work difficult, perhaps even fight them physically, whereas the public wants the public to address crime and public order disturbances as fast as possible. Now, um, Egon Bittner famously wrote that police work can be defined as something that ought not to be happening and about which someone had better do something now, emphasizing both the emergency character of policing and the wide variety of tasks. To be sure, evidence-based practices or naturalistic expertise exist for some familiar scenarios. In other scenarios, pragmatic solutions must be fleshed out on the spot even if the situations are morally challenging and deceptive. Hence, police work is often seen as unscientific, driven by gut feelings, and at times even a cynical nature. Not surprisingly, getting dirty hands is not uncommon in the line of duty. Parts of policing is dirty work, maintains Waddington and several other police researchers. Increased militarization of the police is one blunt solution to the problem and uh, advanced technology so as to improve, for instance, situational awareness another. But in both cases, pushing the limits can be held uh, as praiseworthy. It expresses a willingness to do what is necessary in the service of the public good. As the Police Foundation writes in a report, the police do not always have the luxury of waiting until research yields scientific evidence about the efficacy of a particular approach. When people are dying, the police must act to stop the violence even when doing so carries a degree of political risk. This is a hallmark of courageous leadership. Now, there is, of course, also a slower, scientifically based part of police work pertaining to investigative methodology and forensic CSI stuff. And cutting-edge technology is necessary to detect and counter many novel types of internet-based and global uh, types of crime. So use of emergent technology is of particular interest in our setting. 
emergent technologies are supposed to enhance or extend the police officer's cognitive or physical capacities. You know, to, today drones hover over crime scenes as uh, neo-face live face recognition applications are scanning the crowd. In the background there are systems creating efficient patterns for patrolling, making advanced analysis of criminal networks, providing surveillance as well as forensic analysis, even in the form of phenotyping, which, as we have seen earlier, can create 3D models of faces based on DNA samples. And one can, can only imagine the possibilities flowing from the Elon Musk's uh, recent Neuralink project. Now, emergent technologies are identified by their radical novelty, their relatively fast growth, coherence, prominent impact and uncertainty and ambiguity. The actual effects and side effects remain to be seen. 3D phenotyping may, for the time being, serve as an example of emergent technology. For the police working under pressure, it is tempting to jump on this train. it might just pave the way for some dirty harryism. Not only by intentional misuse, hiding behind the veil of confidentiality, the more interesting scenario, I think, occurs when emergent technologies have scientific credibility, as phenotyping has, but when the output, as well as data security or public acceptance is impossible to assess for the end user. Yeah, the police officers, of course. 3D phenotyping is partly in this category for the time being, I think. But why be so skeptical? Trust trustworthiness is the buzzword. A European Union expert panel focusing on artificial intelligence has stated that Trustworthiness implies that the technology is lawful, ethical, as well as technically and socially robust. The moral concern they emphasize are human rights, privacy, transparency, fairness, bias and accountability. Thus, trustworthiness and emergent technologies may be slightly at odds with each other. The, the simplest uh, ethical solution would be to prohibit emergent uh, systems in policing, labeling every use of emergent technology as morally dirty. But emergent systems may still seem helpful under certain circumstances. They may not be right as rain always, but they might still work. Following cars, I suggest three criteria here for the use of emergent technologies. The first holds that the technology must actually prove to be able to provide the promised output. That means it must be thoroughly tested and is challenged. Anecdotal success under optimal conditions is not that impressive. Reliability hinges on repeated success and actively exposing the system to conditions where it is likely to fail. In other words, a Popperian hunt for system vulnerabilities, so to speak. Secondly, the emergent technology must be the only way of finding the information which is sought after. In other words, if all other means and methods fail, it might be acceptable. A phantom 3D model produced by phenotyping may make new informants come forward, or witnesses come forward. It may also help the investigators generate ideas outside of the box. But the temptation to trust and overuse such applications should be countered by keeping in mind its shortcomings, its uncertainties and its side effects. The output is of little value so far unless 
underpinned by corroborating independent evidence. If trustworthy alternatives exist, they are preferable. Now, the third criterion says that it must also be likely that the output will produce a morally good end. In other words, moral and social aspects must be taken into account. Strategic consideration must also be considered. Uh, not just cost, but is the evidence likely to hold in court? What are the possible side effects? What, what are the possible countermeasures taken by offenders, etc.? These criteria entail, I think, that responsible operators of uh, emergent technologies must think of themselves not just as humans in the loop, but as beta testers, as part of the controlled test regime. I mean, today, self-learning AI systems go through a pre-learning phase where they reinforce themselves by systematizing large, large uh, chunks of, uh, of data. Pre-, pre and post-learning resembles alpha and beta testing of software, where the former typically is done by internal employees and, as I said, the system itself, and the latter by the system's intended users. Beta testing typically aims directly at the technical trustworthiness of the system, the functionality, the accountability, and the reliability. Ethical and social robustness must perhaps be tested so, somewhat differently. So a more comprehensive testing regime, similar to the clinical drug trial regimes, could prove helpful in this respect. I mean, these go through several stages, the small, the larger scale, and the post-market uh, surveillance trials to make sure of the, uh, their quality. The social component, in part by the informed consent of clinical uh, trials from those exposed to the testing, may be hard to obtain in the context of policing, but in many cases, the secret, uh, secrecy is exaggerated, I think. It may seem far-fetched to uh, seek informed consent from the public in order to, to, do, uh, to test cutting-edge police technology, but research history proves misconduct is quite common in the name of the public good, and the police, I mean, responsible for upholding law and order, ought to do better. Many citizens might, for instance, consent to share both photos and DNA if they know that the purpose is only to train algorithms properly so that so as to be able to construct faces more reliable in the case of phenotyping, particularly if they trust the police in the first place. Moreover, controlled test regimes uphold a professional value system within medical research, a system that cannot be taken for, for granted. The situation is different in, for instance, the cyber world. I mean, most programs and applications, even the internet itself, uh, contain grave undocumented security issues. And the police should perhaps not side with the techno-anarchism often found in many private uh, technology and engineering environments, and rather side with the best testing regimes that can be found. Now, to conclude, willingly pushing moral limits may to some uh, represent a display of strength. To others, it represents a foolish lack of foresight, well, justified by exceptional circumstances, but these circumstances could have been known to a, a technologically vigilant police force. As professionals, the police have a duty to keep informed on social and technological developments, but not in a haphazard manner. Scientific critical testing minimizes the need for dirtiness and improves the legal protection of the citizens. And as a general rule, it is better to prepare well than to wait for the exceptional. The police must not end up discussing 
21st century phenomena in uh, 20th century language and fighting them in with a 19th century means. Thank you.